Good evening, everybody. You are watching the long-awaited resurrection of Mario's History Talks. So, where was I in my absence? Kidnapped by the Greeks? Kidnapped by the Bulgarians? Kidnapped by Zayev's government? Well, I'm going to let you decide. But in other news, Zayev's government recently announced the completion of a new highway uh, reaching to Shtip. The name of the highway is the Brothers Miladinov Highway. Now, I anticipate, given the trajectory of things, within a couple of weeks, the Bulgarians will collectively lose their minds over the name of the highway. Why? Well, the name. It's the Brothers Miladinov Highway. They're the two most famous Macedonian poets and literary giants in our tradition. So naturally, the Bulgarians will fight tooth and nail to claim them as Bulgarians. In anticipation of the coming shit show, pardon my French, I have prepared a video giving you five essential facts you need to know before even discussing the brothers Miladinov. You're watching Marius History Talks. I'm Mario Rostovsky, and let's get started. Alright, point number one that you have to know about the brothers Miladinov. The brothers Miladinov, arguably most monumentous contribution to not only Macedonian, but Balkan literature is their anthology of 660 folk songs and stories they collected in the mid-1800s. The name of their work was actually Bulgarian folk songs, Bulgarski Narodni Pesni. In fact, in her history, a lot of efforts were made to conceal this fact and censor it outright. But nonetheless, that is not our game. And much to the sadness of the Greeks and Bulgarians listening to this, the name Bulgarian unfortunately does not convey a whole lot of information. Remember, this is the mid-1800s. Modern day ethnicities are not all that developed. Identities back then were a fluctuating phenomena, often based on political affiliation, church affiliation, language spoken, even social hierarchies. It seldom had to do with actual blood and heritage, but we'll get more into that later. In fact, the brothers Miladinov actually had an explanation as to why they're calling Macedonia, Bulgaria, and not simply Macedonia, as well as their folk songs, Bulgarian folk songs. So, clue right there, why do they need to explain it in the first place if the idea that Macedonia is Bulgaria is such a readily accepted fact? Why need to explain it? But, nonetheless, they do. In a January 8, 1861 letter, Konstantin Milodinov states the following. In the announcement, I called Macedonia West Bulgaria, as it should be called. Because in Vienna, the Greeks treat us like sheep. They consider Macedonia Greek and can understand that it is simply not Greek. So, a couple of things to unpack there. First of all, this is the mid-1800s. The Greeks are, for the first time, trying to enroach on the heritage of Macedonia as part of their Megali Idea. So, they view the Macedonians and Slavs in general living in Macedonia, not, not as actual Slavs that came from the Carpathian Mountains, they actually viewed them as Greeks who had forgotten their language, so they had to be Hellenized to be brought back into the fold, into the Greek nation. Not just this, but the idea that Macedonia is Greek, while still mostly unpopular in the academic and political circles of Greece, they still consider Macedonia to be a foreign and barbarous force, it is nonetheless starting to gain traction in the pro-Hellenic circles of the West, particularly Vienna. So what are the brothers Miladinov doing here? Well, they're basically taking out an insurance policy. By labeling their work Bulgarian, they're not only saying to the world, hey, we're not Greeks, we have nothing to do with the Greeks, but they're attaching themselves to Bulgaria, another Slavic group. They're showing the world they're not in this alone. So the Greeks start to pick at them and they call them usurpers, troublemakers, what, at, what you name it. Uh, they at least have some sort of backing that they're not in this alone. They're part of a larger Slavic speaking group of people, which prior to this time period, wasn't a very strong identity, and we're going to get into that in just a couple of minutes. But another thing you have to realize is, they were only able to call their work Bulgarian folk songs because they had to purchase some 77 folk songs from Bulgaria to be able to use that name. So, again, think of it as an insurance policy. Out of the 660 folk songs in the anthology, only 77 are Bulgarian. That's less than 12%. Not just this, but the regions in which they collected their folk songs are only Macedonia. They didn't even go to Bulgaria. They bought them there. 
But finally, you have to remember is, despite their best efforts to affiliate with the Bulgarians, to give it the Bulgarian label, to even buy Bulgarian songs, the Bulgarians did not publish this work. It was not published in Bulgaria. We really don't know why. Could have been because they were viewed as troublemakers by the Ottoman authorities. Could it be because there was a lot of risk in publishing them? But also could be because the content was not sufficiently Bulgarian enough. And I'm going to explain that in just a couple of minutes. But the fact is, they had to go up to Croatia, up to the Slavic benefactor, uh, Josip Juraj Strosemeyer, an early Pan-Slavicist and arguably Yugoslav, for them to publish their work on June 24th, 1861. All right, point number two. And this is something you have to understand thoroughly, inside and out, before you undertake any study of Macedonia. That is the Slavic National Awakening. So, with the abolition of the Ohrid Archbishopric Church in 1767, Macedonians quickly lost all semblance of political and religious legitimacy they may have enjoyed. They quickly fell under the influence of the Greek Patriarchate Church and their active efforts to re-Hellenize them and bring them back into the Greek nation. The Brothers Milodinov, like many other intelligentsia during this time period, were no exceptions to this rule. It may surprise you to find out, but these two Macedonian giants were educated in Greece, spoke the Greek language fluently, even stated their last name was Miladinadis, a Greek version. Not just this, but as teachers, they taught the native students of Ohrid and Struga in the Greek language. That's how absurd this time period was. However, with increased communication and travel with the outside Slavic-speaking world, particularly in places like Moscow, the Macedonians and other groups started to de-Hellenize their identities. They started to recognize they were not in fact Greeks, but a Slavic-speaking group of people with similar cultures, similar languages, and similar traditions. And by and large, they started to emphasize this identity as opposed to their Greek-imposed identity. Now, this was easier said than done. Back then, even not speaking in the Greek language or not teaching Greek could have been treasonous. So, they had to find a legitimate, politically legitimate expression of their Slavic identity. Back then, and in many ways, to this very day, identities were rooted in the Middle Ages. For a people to be recognized as legitimate, they not only had to have an empire that bore their name, but also a church that was also recognized. For the Greeks, this came quite simply. They had the Roman Empire, or I should say the Eastern Roman Empire, also incorrectly called the Byzantine Empire. Not only was it Orthodox, it was heavily Greek-speaking, heavily uh, Greek influence in terms of its culture, but this gave the Greeks a legitimate expression of their Greek identity. And during this time period, Greeks were in fact calling themselves Chromoi, not, not Hellenes. They were calling themselves Romans because this is the identity they had picked up from the Middle Ages. And in fact, it is the longest running Greek identity, not Helen, that they have been using. In fact, they were still using the Roman identity up until the 1900s. But nonetheless, that was the scene for the Greeks. For the Macedonians, they had to find the equivalent to this, the Slavic equivalent to the Greek Romoi. By default, they only could use the Bulgarian empires of the Middle Ages. Think about it. The Macedonians did not have an empire that bore their name. Tsar Samuel may not have been Bulgarian, but he certainly used the name Bulgarian in his empire. The Bulgarian empires, while not initially Slavic, became Slavic, and they were so massive they not only were recognized by the Byzantines, but their churches were also recognized by Constantinople. This was the perfect choice. Macedonians were using the Bulgar identity as the antithesis, as the equivalent to the Greek-centered Romoi. They were both empires of the Middle Ages, both massive, both legitimate, both with churches of their name. But don't let the names fool you. For example, Roman did not necessarily confer an ethnic identity. Back then, ethnicities were unheard of. To call yourself Roman simply meant that you were Orthodox, spoke the Greek language, espoused a Roman way of acting in your behavior, whatever that meant. But that was pretty much it. It didn't really mean much. It, be it came to mean a national identity in the 1800s, but before that, it really did not confer anything other than that. Same thing can arguably be said for the Bulgarian identity. It was simply an expression of a pan-Slavic ideal uniting a lot of Slavic peoples 
under the helm of the Bulgarian empires of the Middle Ages and re-establishing, re-emphasizing a Slavic language and a Slavic identity in the face of the Greek Roman identity. It made perfect sense. But point number three you have to know about the brothers Miladinov is this. Despite calling themselves Bulgars, they still in fact asserted their ancient origins, their ancient identity in the Balkans. We know they called themselves Bulgars for a number of reasons, and they used this identity quite a lot. Obviously, it meant a lot to them. But the question I estimate we should be asking is not, did it mean a lot to them? Obviously, it did. What did it mean to them? What were their implications when they said this? Allow me to explain. Yes, they call themselves Bulgars, but in other instances, they're also calling themselves Macedonians. In one letter, they very clearly state, Nie Makedonchinata, we the young Macedonians. But this is where the story gets a little bit more complicated and a little bit more interesting. So yes, we see them calling themselves Bulgars and Macedonians, but in other letters, they're also calling themselves Pelasgians, and their language, the Pelasgian language. And as you know from my previous videos, the Pelasgians mentioned all the way in Herodotus, mentioned uh, as being the first inhabitants of the Balkans before the arrival of the Greeks and several millennia before the arrival of the Bulgars. Let's take a look at some of the letters. In a letter dated the 20th of August, 1857, uh, Dimitar Milodinov, while writing in Greek, describes the inhabitants of Macedonia as such. He says, Mato Pelasgo Slavikon Ethnos, which means with the Pelasgian Slavic nation. Very clearly he states Pelasgian, but he's also uh, intentionally using the word ethnos, which means nation, the root word of our modern word, ethnicity. So he's not saying this is some phantom identity, some construct. He's very clearly saying this is the ethnic affiliation, this is the ethnic origin of the inhabitants of Macedonia. But this is not his only reference to the people of Macedonia as being Pelasgian. In another letter, um, Dimitar Milodinov also, writing in 1857, this time in uh, Slavic vernacular, he says, they, being the Greeks, uproot our Slavo-Pelasgian language, one of the oldest and ancient and rich languages. So with this, we can immediately disqualify the fact that he didn't know what he meant when he was writing the word Pelasgian. Very clearly he does. He's clearly stating it is one of the oldest and ancient languages in the Balkans. He knows what he's saying with this. He is saying not only is the ethnic character of the Macedonians Pelasgian, but so is their language. And if you read the ancient works, particularly those of, I believe, Justin, he says the Macedonians are of Pelasgian roots. So this idea is not that far-fetched. Many other authors, many other historians have posed the same idea. The brothers Miladinov are one of them. So this, of course, now begs the question. Were these two brothers bona fide Bulgars, the same as those living in Sofia? Could these two educated men have possibly been blind to the fact that the Bulgars only stepped foot in the Balkans in the 7th century AD, and yet here they are calling their language and their identity Pelasgian? Absolutely not. There is no way any educated man of the time period could have made this blunder. And that actually brings us to point number four. The brothers Miladinov had references and songs about the ancient inhabitants of Macedonia in their anthology. This is a fact that's very inconvenient for both the Greeks and the Bulgarians, but it is nonetheless true. Not only were they calling themselves and their people Pelasgian, but they actually had evidence to back this claim up. The illiterate, the poor peasantry of Macedonia in the mid-1800s under the boot of the Ottomans still held the memory of Alexander the Great alive and well in their oral tradition, and if it wasn't for the brothers Miladinov, we never would have known this. In one of those songs, actually a story, it's about Alexander the Great and his sister Salonika, Thessalonika, and him going to find immortality in a fountain, a very uh, similar motif in many other cultures, but it is nonetheless indigenous to Macedonia. In another reference, the brothers talk about the founding of the city Vodin, very clearly saying it is the city of the ancient Macedonian kings and it was then assumed to be the first capital of Macedonia. They retell the story of how the goats actually found the city and led the king to the path of its future capital. Pretty amazing stuff. Finally, we also have a story about how the Emperor Justinian, widely assumed to be Macedonian or of a Slavic background, 
actually gave the name to the city Ohrid when he looked at the hill and said, Oh my, what a hill. In Mastroin Ohrid Kakofrit. Whether this is true or not, that's for another discussion, but the facts are nonetheless crystal clear. All these figures, all these stories are about people that were there before the arrival of the Bulgars, before the arrival of the Slavs. Nonetheless, the Macedonians are considering them part of their own identity. And most importantly though is, they are distinguishing, the brothers Miladino very clearly distinguish between Macedonian kings and Bulgarian kings. They're not attempting to fuse them in this absurd amalgam of the Macedonians and Bulgarians having the same heritage, having the same ancient roots. So again, this begs the question, did they view themselves as actual Bulgarians rooted in the rival of the Bulgars in the 7th century when their people were very clearly not telling them stories about Asparuch, Krume, or Presian in any of their accounts? Some food for thought. But let's not end there because the fifth thing you have to know about the brothers Miladinov is this. They wrote all their works in their native Macedonian dialects. Sure, the Macedonian language was not developed in, it wasn't standardized, neither was the Bulgarian language for that matter. But to be a Bulgarian back then did have a semblance of how you should speak, what dialects you should speak. There was a hierarchy of dialects. Some were considered more pure than others. And we see this because it was only the Eastern dialects they were considered pure enough to be used in the codification of standard Bulgarian. Despite all this, the brothers Miladinov chose to write in the most geographically distant and isolated language, dialect I should say, they could find, their native Ohrid and Struga dialects. And you look at their songs, you can look at Tugazayuk, arguably one of the most beautiful, poignant poems ever written by a Macedonian, written by, by Konstantin Miladinov, it is in fact written in the Ohrid dialect. If you've had one conversation with anybody from Ohrid, you'd notice this fact immediately. Furthermore, it has features, grammatical constructions, only found in present-day Macedonian and completely absent in Bulgarian. Let's take a look. Right, I'm actually going to read the first two uh, verses because I think they're absolutely beautiful. Aureoski krilja kaktasi metnech, ivonashi strani dasi preletnech, Na nashi mjesta jada si idam, da vidam stambu, kukušta vidam, da vidam dali sunceto i tamu, mračno ugrevjat kako i vamu. Ako kak ovde sunce mi sretit, ako pak mračno sunceto svetit, na pat dalični jake si stegnam, i vo drugi strani ke si pobegnam, kada sunceto svetlo ugrevjat, kada nebo to zvezdi posebjat. So you may have heard some words there that are more archaic than what we use in Macedonian today, but this is, like I said, the 1860s. So, so obviously not all the words would have transferred, but there's a lot here that you need to understand and why it's not Bulgarian. First of all, he says sunse. Do you know what the Bulgarians say for sun? Slunse. El slunse. Not just this, uh, in this line right here. Na nashi mjesta ja da si idam. Ja da si idam. That is a very peculiar Southern Macedonian construction of Yas. Do you know what the Bulgarians say? They don't say Ya, ja, they say Az, Az da si stegnam. I mean, come on. And he says Ya ja completely throughout the poem. Another line he says Ya ja ke si stegnam. Ke. Do you think the Bulgarians say Ke? No, they say Shte. So this line would be Az Shte stegnam. And moving down below, we also have the words mrazoi, snegoi, studoi. This construction of a plural noun not found in modern day Bulgarian. This is only found in southern Macedonian dialects. I still say them. But most importantly, did you see that rhyme at the end of the words here? Stretit, svetit, ugrevyat, posevyat. That is only found in the modern day Ohrid dialects. That IT construction is completely absent anywhere in Bulgaria. But not just this, not just in Tugazayuk, we also see it in the folk story about Alexander the Great. It starts off, Tsar Alexander, Sakashe da hodit da zemit besmrtna voda. So first of all, they say Sakashe, which Bulgarians they would say Iskashe, but there it is again, da hodit i da zemit. I don't say that, but I know a lot of Ohrigani that still say zemit i odit. Pretty amazing stuff. So again, what I'm getting at is, Despite using their best efforts to call their work Bulgarian, to even say they are Bulgarian, they chose to write in the most far-removed dialects they could 
as they were proud of being from Ohrid and Struga, arguably making Konstantin Miladinov and Dimitar Miladinov the first ever Macedonian poets. Amazing stuff. Folks, and uh, that wraps up today's episode, but before I give you my final farewell, just two more things I want to make sure you know about. First of all, please go ahead and read Tugazayuk or Longing for the South. It is arguably the most beautiful Macedonian poem ever written. Konstantin Miladinov penned it while living in Russia and feeling that all too familiar pain and separation anxiety being away from our dear Macedonia. We all want to be back. We all are separated from our homelands. We all know what it's like to be under our Macedonian sun in our cities like Ohrid, like Prilip, like Bitol, like Struga, like Kukush even that he mentions in the song. We know that pain. Please go ahead and read it. It's not that difficult. It's readily understood in the modern day Macedonian language. Let me know what you think down below. The second thing is, like I said, with all Macedonians from the past, the brothers Miladinov are products of their time period. Obviously, they may have made decisions that we would otherwise not make today, but we cannot assign modern day objective criteria in how good or bad they were as individuals. Because at the end of the day, they were Macedonians, we know that they were Macedonians, but they were in fact Macedonian martyrs. They in fact were imprisoned for what they did. They went to prison in Istanbul and they both died in prison only days apart. So that's what happened when you went up against the Greek Patriot propaganda machine. You were imprisoned. So this makes the brothers Miladinov arguably Macedonian pioneers. The content and character of their entire anthology we know objectively is Macedonian despite the title. The language is Macedonian, the figures, the history, the folk songs are all from Macedonians. So just remember, next time you're driving on this Brachia Miladinovsi highway, these two brothers they had their last breath in hope that you would know what your ancestors considered worthy to keep alive through oral tradition and what they themselves considered to be greater than death, which was preserving who they were. So just think about that. But in the meantime, folks, thank you again for watching Mario's History Talks. Feels good to be back, and I promise you, I am back for good. But in the meantime, stay safe and keep fighting for Macedonia. Take care, folks.